Well, it is a joy and a privilege to be able to be up here and share God's words with his saints. And this morning, we're going to be spending our time on the book of Titus, uh, namely on chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. So if you need some time to get there, go ahead and turn to Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. Uh, it's toward the back of the New Testament, and if you hit Hebrews or James, you went too far. You've got to go back a little bit. And uh, as we get started with God's Word this week, um, it is good to give some, some feedback and some context as to the letter of Titus to help us in understanding uh, the passage this morning. So to give you some background on the book of Titus, uh, it was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to Titus. Uh, Titus was one of Paul's disciples. He was a young pastor that at the time he was planting and building up churches in different areas in the early, in the early church. And Paul writes the letter to Titus to address several issues. One of them was the, the complete, to complete the organization of elders and appointing elders at the different churches in the area. But he's also addressing two particular issues. One was the, the presence of false teachers uh, within the, the churches. And, uh, and also to give, the other one was to give instructions on proper conduct in the churches. So sound leadership was particularly important at this time, um, especially because of this false teaching that had risen in the churches. Um, these false teachers were said to be of the party of circumcision. And uh, the false teaching basically consisted on bringing works and the, and, and the law of Moses back into the gospel and mixing our own works uh, for, for salvation. And because of that, they were unsettling a lot of believers and a lot of families. Also, Titus at this time, he was ministering in the island of Crete, which let's just say that it was a very ethically murky and unhealthy cultural environment to be in. Uh, Paul even quotes one of uh, a Cretan author of the time that he referred to his compatriots as Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So if you don't like your society or your neighborhood, these people, I think, had it worse. But in that whole context, the church in which uh, Titus was ministering uh, at was surrounded by, on the one hand, false teaching, teaching that caused people to despair and look away from Christ. And on the other hand, they were situated in this lawless culture, in a cultural milieu. So in all this, believers could have well asked themselves, how, how do we live? How do we live as Christians in this environment that we are in? And given all these pressures that we get from every side. And, uh, and Paul goes on to proclaim that the answer to this false teaching of legalism or lawlessness and the answer to how we are, ought to live, all that is founded and rooted in the gospel. And that is what I'll seek to develop for us this morning. But before that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you that indeed it was your work that saved us and not anything that we brought to the table that would have made us desirable before you. Thank you that you saved us, Lord. Um, I ask that anything that I say that is unhelpful this morning, that will be promptly forgotten in anything that is true and helpful for the saints this morning. I ask that will be treasure in their hearts and that you, you will use it to transform our hearts and minds this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So let, let us now turn to the text and read Titus 3, verses 3 through 8. For we ourselves were once foolish, foolish, disobedient, led astray, slave to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Amen, and thank God for his word. Our heart's already full just reading that. 
So in the text, we see that Paul appeals to the gospel as the foundation and driver of our lives. Paul's argument can be divided in three main points. He starts by instructing Titus and encouraging him and reminding him in believers of who we were before Christ while we were yet in our sins. Then he moves on to encourage us by describing who we are now in Christ. He proclaims the gospel and he proclaims our new identity in Christ. And then he concludes by pointing out how we are to, to live and conduct ourselves um, in our lives in regards to good works. So that will be our outline this morning. So if you're taking notes, it should be pretty easy to follow along. I might throw some random bullet points in here. I might let you know, but uh, just you've been warned if you're taking notes. So point number one is who we were before Christ is the reminder of ourselves while we were still in our sins. So verse three paints a very bleak picture. It's for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, let us stray, slave to passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And this statement describes the universal reality of all people who are without Christ. Before Christ, we were in Adam. We were, Adam was our covenant head and he sinned. And because of his failure, all of us from all of us, his ascendants, were slave to sin and bound to condemnation. Ephesians 2.12 says, Remember that we were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and stranger to, co to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. So this particular passage is talking about Gentiles, but it applies to everyone who is outside of Christ. That is the reality of people who are still in their sins. They're alienated from God. They have no promise of salvation, no promise of eternal life, no hope. Think of this for a moment. Think of all the hardship, the death, the, the suffering that sin produces in the world. And we were enslaved to that grind and had no reason to even desire or look at God. As a result, we were lost and justly condemned because it is impossible for spiritually dead people to even look to Christ so they may live. And no amounts of work or morality or activism will fill that hopeless void, that, for etern that hope for eternity that people have in their hearts without God. So it is the sobering reality of people without Christ today. And scriptures reminds us that so were we. And it is important for us to remember that lest we'll, we'll be self-righteous in any way, lest we think that Anything other than a miraculous outside act from God intervening directly on our life had to do with our salvation. Verse 4, it is a beautiful transition. When Paul says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Oh, there it is, the but Christ. By Christ, that beautiful conjunction that shows the stark change, the stark contrast between who we were outside of Christ and who we are now in Christ. So point number two is the proclamation of the gospel and our new identity in Christ. As we just read, when the goodness and loving kindness of God appeared, he saved us. I love the way that he simply states it as fact. Christ came. And the motivation for Christ's coming wasn't that he saw us and he saw anything good, that he saw any works in us that would merit his favor. He saw any righteousness in us that would have led him to extend mercy on us. No, Christ, because of his goodness and loving kindness, he saved us by his mercy, not by any righteousness that we could supply because we have none, because it is an impossibility for humans to achieve the favor of God by their own righteousness. So we see here in this passage that Paul is appealing to the first coming of Christ. So um, the goodness of God appears. So it is appealing to when Christ came to this earth to accomplish our salvation. Christ, he died on the cross and he also lived the perfect life so that through his passive obedience, he may fulfill all righteousness 
and through, excuse me, through his active obedience, he fulfilled all righteousness. And through his passive, passive obedience in dying for us on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. So when Christ on the cross said, it is finished, brothers and sisters, he accomplished your salvation then, and you were saved. And Christ delivered us from all the things that, all that, that bleak picture that is painted in verse 3, our former self, Christ saved us and delivered us because of his own loving kindness and goodness and mercy and grace. Furthermore, in verse 5, we see that he saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul has an uncanny ability of packing a lot of meaning in a very short sentence, so I will aim to unpack this for us this morning. There's a lot of content and a lot of very impactful truth for us this morning. First of all, he saved us by the washing. Now, the washing here refers to the spiritual cleansing, um, which is uh, symbolized by the sign and seal, which is baptism, right? So we had last Sunday a baptism here at CBC, and what a wonderful time in which we saw uh, three young believers go into the waters of baptism that, that represent God's judgment, going into those waters representing the death of their old self, of the old man, the death of the flesh, the death of that condemned old self that we all once were, and then emerging from the, from the waters victorious, just as Christ emerged victorious from the dead, and he, um, and he rose for our righteousness. So when we rise, rise from the waters of baptism, we are united to Christ and with all his promises and all his merits. So furthermore, it talks about the washing of regeneration, and it talks of saving us by the, um, the regeneration and renewal. And those two words there are qualifying the word washing. Now, regeneration refers to the new life that begins when a person comes to faith in Christ. And it's interesting to point that regeneration actually comes before faith because spiritually dead people cannot see God, cannot seek him, let alone believe and become part of his kingdom. So Christ does his regenerating work in our hearts, and given us new life so that we can now see and see God and believe and trust and have faith. Furthermore, we are told of the renewal that this washing brings, and that word renewal is closer related to, to rebirth, uh, to this remaking, this transformation that God brings about in the life of the person whom he saved, from the person of the believer. So brothers and sisters, to Bring it all together. When Christ saved us, he made us new. He washed us. He regenerated us. He gave us new life. He renewed us and gave us new birth. And he is transforming us into his image. So we no longer are what we used to be, but now we have new life and a new identity in Christ. And we are forever united to him. Moving along, Christ, he richly poured the spirit in us. And what a beautiful statement. What a beautiful truth. What a strong truth, brothers and sisters, that the Holy Spirit of God indwells us. We know this. We believe this. And this is true and is hard to fathom. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. And the Spirit applies to us the grace of God that is extended to us in Christ. And know how be note how beautiful this picture is of the involvement of the entire Trinity in this passage. We see that God the Father saves us by the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit who is poured out onto us through Christ. So the entire Godhead was involved in our salvation because God loved us and he had mercy on us. Christ, he also justified us before God by his grace. So through his active obedience, Christ fulfilled the law and for us who believe in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. It is given to us, and it is as if we had never sinned, and therefore we can be accepted before God by Christ's righteousness that is given to us by grace and by faith alone. Nobody any works of righteousness that we might bring to the table, because as we consider earlier, we have no righteousness except for that which is given to us by Christ. Christ united us to himself, and he made us heirs with him. 
So Christ didn't accomplish his work of salvation just to save us from judgment, but for so much more. He made us part of his family through adoption and thus heir with him to all the promises. So brothers and sisters, rejoice that we are united to Christ and we are heir of all the promises of eternal life with Jesus Christ. And we are heaven bound because of everything that Christ has done for us. Because of these truths, we have the hope of eternal life. Not because of anything that we do, but because we're bound and united to Christ. Christ who rose from the dead. Christ who will never die. Christ who lives forever. And because he lives forever, so will we. So let us rejoice on that promise. So once Paul makes all these deep statements and instructs, um, then he moves on to instruct Paul by saying, this saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things. So Paul is doubling down again on the gospel. So what is the saying? It is the gospel. It is the proclamation that Christ saved us and all the merits that he earned are now ours through our union with him. Furthermore, Paul exhorts Titus to insist on these things. So to insist on the gospel and the finished work of Christ. For what? To what purpose? So that believers will devote themselves to good works. So we see here that the foundation and driver of good works in our lives is the gospel. It is the work that Christ has done for us. Now notice that Paul doesn't say, insist on these things so that in order for these things to be true for you, now you better live this way. Paul doesn't say, now for these things, in order to remain true for you, now you should live this way. He doesn't say that in order that for you to be sure that these things are true for you, now you better live this way. There's no threats. There are no ifs or buts in here. No, he says that the saying is trustworthy. The saying is fact and it is truth. Trust the gospel, which is the proclamation that Christ saves sinners like us through his fulfillment of all righteousness and his death and resurrection for all who trust in him. Amen. So we considered who we were while we were yet in our sins and the magnitude of God's salvation, the miracle that God produced in our lives, but by giving us new life and eternal life through the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now we move to the next, uh, next point, which we're going to be spending uh, the majority of our time this morning, which is how do, how do we live? So point number three, my title is, therefore, live this way. So here we're going to consider how the gospel produces good works in us. But before we do that, it is useful for us to, uh, to define what good works are. Uh, the term good works is perhaps very familiar to us. We hear it all along our Christian lives. Uh, but people define it in many ways, and many of those ways uh, can be very unhelpful. Uh, so in order to, cl to add clarity to today's message, um, I just wanted to read from our uh, confession, the Second London, ba London Baptist Confession, uh, how works are defined, how good works are defined. Um, so our confession defines good works as works, uh, those that are only the works that God has commanded in his holy word. Works that do not have this warrant are invented by people out of blind zeal or on a pretense of good intentions and are not truly good. So based on our confession, we understand that good works are simply those things that God has commanded us to do. Uh, they're not man-made works or churchly traditions or Christian disciplines, and they're certainly not any man-made efforts to supply in any way that which Christ has freely and richly done for us that we can have by faith. So with that definition out of the way, let us continue on. So how does the proclamation of the gospel make us pursue good works? And first of all, it's because it reminds us of who we are, that our identity is in Christ. It reminds us that we are no longer slaves to sin, but are now free in Christ. Free to not sin, which is something that was impossible for us before Christ because we were dead in our sins before. Romans 6.22 says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification 
and its, its end is eternal life. So notice here, it contrasts who we were and now that we are slaves to God, alive in Him. And the fruit that we get is not fruit that we earn or fruit that we do. It's fruit that we get through the sanctification, through the work of the Spirit in us, is eternal life. Furthermore, Christ has made us righteous and has filled us with the Holy Spirit. Philippians 1.11 says that we are filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. God is also the one who produces all these good works in us. Philippians 2.13 also says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Brothers and sisters, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit who leads us into all good works. Godliness is the product of Christ's sanctifying work through the Holy Spirit in us. He will produce it in our lives, and it will be manifested in ways that are in step with the regeneration that Christ has brought in our lives. The Holy Spirit will produce good works and godly living contrary to our sinful flesh. It will produce works that are impossible for us to achieve by our own efforts or disciplines, for they are the fruit of the Spirit. It is the outworking of the Spirit in our lives. And those, we know what they are, but let's just remind us for the sake of the passage, the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So brothers and sisters, when you see these things manifested in your life, know that they are not of your works, but it is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. We were also made for these good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. After considering all these passages, it is clear that the result, um, that our works are the result of a supernatural transformation that it is done by the Holy Spirit in our lives as it is stirred by the preaching of the gospel that brings about our love and gratitude towards God and in turn drives us to pursue good works for his sake. So brothers and sisters, that was a mouthful, but it is the work of Christ in you. And the proclamation of the gospel stirs love and gratitude in our hearts toward God. So this is how that works. So as we grow in our knowledge and under, in understanding of all that Christ has accomplished for us, the result is godliness, which is produced by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And this runs actually counter to what we often hear, that the overemphasis on the gospel and the finished work of Christ will somehow produce spiritual laziness in our hearts or somehow will make us less diligent to pursue obedience. But that could not be further away from the truth. Um, Because I can attest my own experience and many here at CBC that after sitting Sunday after Sunday under the preaching of the gospel and the proclamation that Christ is enough and that he has done it all, that has produced so much sanctification in my life by leading me to Christ, by showing me the extent of my own sinfulness. When I think I'm pretty good, the gospel tears me down and shows me that, no, I was a lost sinner and I'm way more sinful than I could possibly think. If I think that I have any righteousness through which to please God, the gospel tears down my notion of self-righteousness and shows me that there is nothing I could do to be accepted by Christ through my own works. And then the gospel builds us back up by showing us that the mercy and love and goodness of God indeed reached us and that Christ saved us and that all of his merits are now ours. So brothers and sisters, none of us I trust no believer, when they hear these words, we walk out of here not thinking, oh, great, there is grace, so I'm just going to go sin. No, nobody thinks that way, but rather we are built up, built up in Christ and we're encouraged to go out there and live in newness of life and pursue the good works that Christ has, has done for us. So we hear that love and gratitude are often the, the, the motivators, the, the rightful motivators uh, for good works. You know, we, we don't do good works to earn any merit or favor, but that we should do them out of love and gratitude. And that is correct. Um, however, you might ask of yourself, well, 
how can I muster love and gratitude towards God so that it would produce good works or godliness in my heart? Um, if you're like me, you would realize that we often fail at loving um, even those closest to us, like our spouse, our children, family, let alone God and, and, and our brothers and sisters at church. So how can my love and gratitude that are flawed, which are flawed, drive my good works? And brothers and sisters, that is because those two are the product of the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, the love and gratitude that we speak of are not just mere human emotions that change according to our circumstances, but it is the, the love and gratitude that drives our godliness because it's fueled by the proclamation of the gospel that stirs up through the Holy Spirit love and gratitude towards God, which in turn outflows uh, into the form of, in, in the form of love and good works towards one another. So now that we considered what good works are, we consider the, the biblical and drivers of good works in our lives and what are the motivations for good works, it is worth mentioning what good works are not and what they're not for and maybe clarify some uh, unhelpful teaching that we may have received uh, elsewhere uh, or maybe growing up. So something to be clear about is that Good works have nothing to do with our standing before Christ. And the doctrine of, of, of the works and how we live in life, it, it, it's often taught in very uh, unhelpful ways. In some Christian circles, it seems like that's all they talk about. The gospel is hardly ever mentioned. It's either mentioned out of some evangelistic campaign or as a nutshell gospel presentation, as a tag in to some message that had nothing to do with it. Um, and there's always that veiled threat that the messages are all about and what we ought to do with that veiled threat, with that unstated understanding that if the quality or consistency of your, the works in your life is not there, then, then you may have reason to doubt your, that you have favor before God. And nothing is more destructive to the Christian life than eroding the foundation of our assurance of salvation, which is Christ and never our works. On the other extreme, we see that to react to that over and, and incorrect emphasis on works, we see that some churches or some teachers never speak of works by fear that it would produce legalism or make us judgmental in some way. But the proper response to incorrect teaching is not to ignore it or to uh, react and go to the opposite extreme, but it is to properly and correctly teach the truth from the Bible. So to be clear as brothers and sisters, godliness is never the basis on which we are accepted by God. Good works are never the basis on which we are saved or the basis on which we keep our salvation or are assured that we are saved. Brothers and sisters, Christ and Christ alone is the basis of our salvation. Christ and his work alone are the foundation and guarantee that we are saved and that he will keep us until we're finally saved with him in glory. Now, indeed, we can be very encouraged by seeing the fruit of the Spirit and the good works in our lives, but that can never be the foundation of our assurance. So, brothers and sisters, if you're in need of assurance this morning, look to Christ. Look back at the passage, verses 4 through 7. The point that Paul is making is trust in him and all that he has done for you and hold on to that. Hold, hold on to the trustworthy saying that Christ saved you, brothers and sisters. Your assurance is the finished work of Christ for you. Godliness does not make you, does, godliness does not make God view you more favorably. It does not act or detract uh, from your standing before God, but it is the outflow of a life that has been regenerated and that is being transform, transformed and sanctified by the work of God. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, so if my good works have no bearing on my standing before Christ, then what are good works for? What do they matter? And I would say, well, that's a great question. Let's answer that. So we don't do good works to, to keep or gain or prove our standing before God, but we do good works because these things are excellent 
and good for people, as it is stated on verse 8. Brothers and sisters, our good works are not for God. He doesn't need anything from us. Our good works are for our neighbor. The godliness that he produces in us is the benefit, is a benefit to the believer, the church, and the world around us. Let us think of this for a moment. Think of how our lives are helped and benefited when, as our response to the proclamation of the gospel and for Christ's sake, we strive to live godly lives. Think of how impactful and life-transforming it would be if instead of merely emphasizing Christian disciplines in the privacy of our home, we showed Christ-like grace, kindness, mercy, and humility toward one another. Think of how much better our lives are and the life within the church when we pursue this godly living. And also by the church pursuing godliness, uh, we become a good testimony to the world, world outside of outside of us, to those outside the church, so as to give no reason for people to speak evil of Christ in our account, and also that they may see our work and glorify our Father who is in heaven and be attracted to Him. And now as I seek to tie everything together and we start driving toward the conclusion of, of this message, how do we put some handles on, on these truths this morning? How do we apply this to our lives. And this is what our confession says. I'll be reading again from the, uh, our London Baptist Confession. Here it says, their ability to do good works, so the ability of the believer to do good works, does not arise at all from themselves, but entirely from the Spirit of Christ. To enable them to do good works, they need, in addition to the graces they have already received, in addition to salvation through the merits of Christ, so in addition to the graces that they have already received, an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them to will and to do his good pleasure. Yet, this is no reason for them to grow negligent as if they were not required to perform any duty without a special motion of the Holy Spirit. Instead, they should be diligent to stir up the grace of God that is in them. Here we learn that good works Again, they don't come from us, but they're the work, excuse me, they're the works of the Holy Spirit in us. So what then? So what then? Do we just let go and let God? We just sing, Jesus, take the wheel, and I'm just going to sit there idle and wait for God just to make me do good works. No, we don't do that. Absolutely not. We are rather diligent to stir up the grace of God that is in us. Now, how do we do that? Well, you may have heard the, this, this term before, but we do that through the ordinary means of grace that God has given us, which are the preaching of the word, the singing of hymns, the fellowship of the saints, and the partaking of the sacraments. That is how we are diligent to stir up the graces of God in us. As we engage in the means of grace by faith, even if we do it imperfectly, even if we do it reluctantly, God uses those to sustain, to strengthen, and supply to us all the things that our faith lacks. And as we engage with the ordinary means uh, and sit under the proclamation of the gospel, we are encouraged and spurred on to live godly lives. So no believer, after being reminded of the rich grace of God toward them and the all-sufficient work of Christ, walks away thinking, great, I'm going to sin all the more. But rather, believers are all the more desirous to pursue godliness. And that, brothers and sisters, is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. So as we draw to our conclusion this morning, we have considered who we were before Christ. And we have considered the miracle that at the right time, the love and kindness, the loving kindness and goodness of God appeared in Christ, saved us. Never forget, brothers and sisters, and let this be before you always, that it took the miracle of God to make you alive in him again, and all the merits of Christ are yours, so that you are secure in Christ, and you are a new creation, and that you are heaven-bound because you're united to Christ who is our Lord and Savior, and we will live with him forever in eternity. Now we also, 
have been have considered that the gospel is the foundation and the driver of our Christian lives. So, brothers and sisters, let us pursue godliness because Christ saved us. Uh, he gave us new life, a new identity, and the power to overcome sin. So let us pursue godliness by faith in Christ, knowing that he is changing us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And even though we fail, even though we stumble, and our works are often imperfect and tainted by our own sin and wrongful motivations, he is renewing us, and he is redeeming our, our works, and our works are now accepted by, uh, by God on account of Christ. Finally, let's pursue godliness because it is good for us and it is good for our neighbors. And brothers and sisters, to conclude this morning, always keep the gospel before you. That is the key. It is the answer. It is the answer to everything. Remembering that the saying is trustworthy. Christ saves you. Trust the works of Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that indeed at the right time you appeared and you saved us because of your loving kindness, mercy, and grace. We thank you, Lord, that all these things have already been done by you in us, and there's no way we can mess this up, Lord. I ask that you continue to sustain us through the ordinary means and that you continue to sanctify us and transform us through the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, Lord. I ask that we, walk out of, we would walk out of here transformed and desirous to live godly living because you saved us, Lord. We ask that you do these things in Jesus' name. Amen.